In this video, we will discuss an overview of the evidence for climate change with some focus on the United States. My name is Kirby R. Cundiff. I have a PhD in theoretical physics and an MS in finance from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I'm also a chartered financial analyst and a certified financial planner. I'm currently chair of accounting and financial management for the graduate school at University of Maryland University College. This presentation is similar to one I made for the Eurasian Multidisciplinary Forum as a keynote address in Tbilisi, Georgia on October 25, 2013. At that point in time, I was the chair of the Division of Business Administration at the Rochester Institute of Technology in Dubai. When looking at climate change, there is a whole variety of different data one can examine. The ice core data is the longest in length, going back for 500,000 years. Satellite data is very accurate, but only goes back to the 1970s. There is also tree ring data, borehole data, cave sediment data, coral growth data, lake sediment data, etc., and one that is focused on in a lot of detail, thermometer data, but that only goes back to the 1880s. This graph shows ice core data going back for about half a million years and shows massive variations in temperatures ranging over 10 degrees centigrade. The warm periods like we are today are actually relatively rare most of the time, the Earth was in relatively cold time periods resembling ice ages, the most recent ice age being around 10,000 years ago. So we go from warm peaks to cold periods to warm peaks to cold periods. There are various theories, but none of them are really very good about what determines this huge change in temperature. And since these massive changes in temperature of over 10 degrees centigrade are extremely large compared to the very small changes of under a degree centigrade that we refer to as global warming, this graph itself is probably the strongest indication that man-made global warming is questionable. After all, how can we say men are responsible for something like a 0.6 degree C change when we don't know what caused over 10 degrees C in change, and it certainly wasn't manned several hundred thousand years ago. It is noted that this graph, there is a correlation between CO2 concentrations and temperature, but as we will discuss later, the cause-effect relationship is still in question. For this graphical time period, it does appear that the CO2 concentration is higher than it has been in the past, and it is distinctly possible that that increase in the red line in CO2 is in fact man-made. How is ice core data determined? The measurement of the gas composition is direct. CO2 can be measured directly. Um, the ice core is obtained in Antarctica, oh, Greenland, northern Canada, anywhere that deep ice is available. Temperature is determined indirectly from the ratio of either 16 oxygen to 18 oxygen or one hydrogen to two hydrogen or deuterium, which is known to be correlated with the temperature at the time the ice is frozen. This graph shows a blow up of the ice core data for around the last quarter of a million years and when the ice core data is examined in more detail, it finds that yes, there is a CO2 correlation with temperature, but in fact, temperature goes up before CO2 goes up. So temperature is the driver. CO2, well, it's a greenhouse gas, is not the driver of temperature increasing temperature rise is the driver of CO2 increasing, and there is a lag about 880 years. This has to do with trapping of CO2 in the oceans, and also the possibility as temperature increases, 
more creatures like mammals will survive, and they also emit CO2. For a detailed analysis of this discussion, you can look at the geophysical research letter referenced at the bottom of this text. So while CO2 is a greenhouse gas, it is a relatively minor greenhouse gas. The primary greenhouse gas is in fact water vapor. Another source of data is satellite data, but again satellites have only been available since Sputnik and temperature satellites have largely only been available since the late 1970s. This graph does show some increase in temperature since the 70s, relatively minor on the order of half a degree centigrade. It is also of interest to examine record highs and record lows throughout the human history, at least when we have had um, available somewhat accurate thermometers. The highest temperature ever recorded was not in the immediate last few years, but in 1913 in Furnace Creek, Death Valley, California, of 134 degrees Fahrenheit, R56.7 degrees C. The lowest natural temperature ever recorded on Earth was minus 89 degrees C, or minus 128.6 degrees Fahrenheit, at the Soviet Vostok Station and Antarctica in 1983. The temperature data, again, only goes back to the late 1880s. There are going to be reasonably large air bars in the temperature data. Uh, most of the temperature data was not designed for the purpose of scientific instruments, was designed to the purpose of, if I travel to this location, what will the temperature be like at the airport? So just on that basis, you can see there are reasonably large air bars on this graph. And this graph shows a temperature increase over that time period of around 0 0.6, 0 0.8 degree centigrade, which is again quite small compared to the 10 degree centigrade temperature changes in the ice core data. Beyond that, there is the question of how accurate this data is and how big an effect the heat island effect has had. Most of these thermometers, the late 1800s, would have been located in cornfields, um, rural areas. Uh, certainly there is global warming, or not global warming, but there is warming due to asphalt and other things around cities. And these thermometers may have gone from being in a rural location to now in an urban location. Some of them are in places which they really shouldn't be for scientific reasons. Here, for example, is a picture of a thermometer right by a brick wall with windbreaks and a refrigeration unit next to it. All of these are going to make the temperature in this area much higher than the surrounding area. Um, efforts to correct the temperature data for the heat island effect are questionable, and this could be a cause of so-called global warming, which is really just local warming. Now we're going to examine some temperature data that I analyzed for all 50 of the United States. This was looking at the temperature data set um, and just looking at record highs and record lows to see how those varied as a function of time. Here is a typical graphical output of this data for my hometown of Kirksville, Missouri and it shows the number of January record highs as a function of decade. You can see that record highs might be increasing, but in January, certainly the maximum were in the 1950s, and maybe there is a warming period from the 70s to 2000. 70s, we had a lot of snow. Certainly, around 2000, we did not. The record highs, on the other hand, during the summer, we're all pretty much in the 1930s during the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. And record high summers have been relatively rare since then in the 70s and 80s. I remember my father telling me about farmers in the 1930s having to cut down trees during the drought so the cows would survive and eat the leaves off the trees because there was nothing else available. 
Here is number of January record lows. Again, there haven't been a lot of record lows in recent years, and most of them here were in the 19th, sorry, the peak of them was in the 1970s, so there could be an indication of perhaps warmer Januaries. Also, number of July record lows seems to have decreased in recent years. To analyze this data beyond graphical data, we use t-statistics, the standard approach of the social sciences. Um, we're going to look at the simple equation y equals mx plus b, where y is going to be the number of record high or low temperatures per decade, and x is the decade in which they took place. To see whether we have a statistically significant increase or decrease in record highs or lows, we will look at the number of record highs or lows minus the average over the standard error of those measurements. And if the change is much larger than the ability to measure that change, then we would say we have a statistically significant increase in the number of record highs or lows. On the other hand, if t is relatively small, then we would say there is no significant increase or decrease. Statistical significance is generally indicated for a T of around 1.96 for a large data set. So here is the list of our data for January and July for both record highs and record lows at locations randomly picked in each of the 50 states. The red points are above 1.96 and are considered statistically significant. The black points are T stats below 1.96. So you can see that if we look at record high increases in January and July, there do seem to be several of them, but it's not overwhelming. Record lows, the negative in indicates a decrease in record lows, and we do seem to see an indication again of decreases in record lows, but not a ton of them. And the start date for the data ranges from the 1870s to, in some cases, 1920s. We have done this for all 50 states, and in some cases, the number of record highs is decreasing, but in general, the number of record highs is going up and the number of record lows is going down. And again, this is done for all 50 states. We do have, on average, the number of record highs going up in both January and July and the number of record lows going down in both January and July but these numbers are pretty small compared to the standard deviation of them. Um, it's an indication there may be some warming in the sense some increase in record highs and decrease in record lows. It's unclear whether this is due to the heat island effect or whether it is due to actual warming throughout those time periods. For more detailed reading on this paper, it's available at the eujournal.org site. Uh, my name is Kirby Cundiff, published in 2013, entitled An Analysis of Climate Change in the United States Using Record High and Record Low Temperature Data in the European Scientific Journal. One of the competing theories to man-made global warming is that temperature changes in the Earth are caused by changes in solar activity, the sun being the major source of energy for the planet. This graph shows best daily maximum temperatures as a function of year, again from the 1800s to today, and also in red, total solar irradiance, and attempts to correlate the two of them. It seems to work reasonably well, and of course, solar activity might be a way of determining whether the Earth is in an ice age or not. None of this has been really conclusively proved one way or another. 
we will now proceed to examine some of the various uh, scandals and, I guess, dogmatic arguments on man-made global warming. Uh, the individual shown here is the chairman of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change from 2002 to 2015. He has a PhD from North Carolina State University in industrial engineering and economics. Um, his attitude was global warming is sort of a religion. For me, the protection of the planet is more than a mission, it is a religion. And this is an attitude of many of the people who look at environmentalism almost as a religion and aren't really interested in examining the data. He was forced to resign due to a Me Too type sex scandal. The supporters of man-made global warming, the biggest one being the one we just mentioned, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, also, of course, are politicians like Al Gore and scientists such as James Hansen from Columbia and NASA, Michael Mann at Penn State, and Phil Jones at the University of Eng East Anglia in the United Kingdom. There are also many well-known global warming skeptics. Uh, John Christie is still active today at the University of Alabama. He was previously on the IPCC. Uh, the now deceased author Michael Crichton, uh, Freeman Dyson, who holds Einstein's chair at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, uh, Nobel laureates in both physics and chemistry, um, Richard Lindzen at MIT, uh, Frederick Seitz, who used to be the president of the National Academy of Sciences when I was a graduate student at the University of Illinois, I worked in the Frederick Seitz Research Laboratory, Fred Singer, University of Virginia, Willie Soon at the Harvard Smithsonian Center, and the father of the U.S. hydrogen bomb, Ed Teller. Many of these people are now deceased, some are still alive and active. Edward Teller and Frederick Seitz were very active in questioning global warming and this is a list of a petition that they collected of 31,487 American scientists that fall into the skeptical category on man-made global warming at this point in time, including over 9,000 PhDs in signature. Um, Frederick Seitz, during one of the IPC publications was extremely critical of the way the scientific conclusions were summarized by the IPCC. This is part of his publication in 1996 on a major deception on global warming in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, he believed, as noted up here, the following are examples of those included in the approved report but deleted from the supposedly peer-reviewed published version. So after the scientists got together and determined one thing, he believed that the politicians edited it and then published something that was far more drastic in its beliefs in the problems of climate change. So, for example, none of the studies cited above has shown clear evidence that we can attribute the observed climate changes to the specific cause of increases in greenhouse gases, no study to date has positively attributed all or part of the climate change observed to date to anthropogenic man-made causes, and any claims of positive detection of significant climate change are likely to remain controversial until uncertainties in the total natural variability of the climate system are reduced. So these were the conclusions of the scientists, which were then edited for the final publication by the IPCC politicians. A more recent climate scandal, so-called Climate Gate, has to do with emails that were hacked, um, especially those of Phil Jones. So the most commonly quoted email in Climate Gate was, I've just completed Mike's nature trick of adding in the real temps to each series for the last 20 years i.e. from 1981 onwards, 
and from 1961 for Keats to hide the decline. What they were referring to here is the so-called hockey stick graph published by Michael Mann. And you will note here we have data compiled from tree rings and all sorts of other different sources, I guess tree rings, corals, ice core, and historical records. And that is in blue. And then the temperature data from another data source is added at the end. So two different sources and the temperature data then make this huge increase in temperature shown in the last thousand years. Now, since there are tons of different sources of reconstructed data, again, boreholes, temperature rings, etc., you can actually get a whole variety of different temperature assumptions from this. Some of these could be due to the fact that um, the tree rings can be taken from different locations around the world. Some can be obviously these sorts of proxy data are simply not that accurate. Here is a, another effort looking at the data which does not show the hockey stick. You can see the hockey stick in red. Other people looking at the same sort of proxy data show different results in blue and show the fact that this time period here had much higher temperatures than the period today. And in fact, it shows decreases in temperature where the hockey stick data showed increases in temperature. Again, another analysis of the same data showing the medieval warming period, the little ice age, and then questions about whether you have a temperature increase or a temperature decrease related to the proxy data. Another area discussed regularly in global warming or climate change are computer simulations of future temperatures. As you can see from this, the model runs can get drastically different results. Um, I did similar research on opacity, but applied to the sun, not the earth. These are very complicated calculations with lots of variables, and it's somewhat questionable how accurate all the computer simulations are. Again, the computer simulations here seem to have shown a lot higher temperature increases than the actual data, but of course, these computer simulations can vary significantly in their predictions. It is also sometimes stated that as a result of man-made global warming, there are more tornadoes, there are more hurricanes, there are more disasters. This is a graph showing the number of US landfalling major hurricanes, category three by decade from the 1930s until today. It shows, in fact, the number of hurricanes has been going down, not up. And this is available at Dr. Roy Spencer's site, again, with the University of Alabama. For further reading on this topic, I list a large variety of web pages, both on the pro man made global warming site and on the skeptical site, and also one video more on the skeptical site that is available on YouTube. I hope you found this presentation informative and I thank you for watching this video.